Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good day to our audience. My name is Muhammad Hafiz Afan from Advanced Membrane Technology Research Center, MTech, School of Chemical and Engineering. And I'll be sharing the today's session. Welcome to the Distinguished Lecture Series organized by UTM Engineering. We are very fortunate today to have a living legend and world-renowned membrane scientist with hashin deck of 83. Professor Emeritus Takashi Masura, all the way from University of Ottawa, Canada. So basically how I met Prof Masura was back in 2007, when he firstly came to MTech as a distinguished visiting professor. Since then, he visited MTech almost every year for research collaboration, and MTech has also appointed him as a center advisory board until now. Although Prof Masura cannot travel to Malaysia this year due to COVID-19, we are very happy to see Prof Masura again today via online platform. And he will be sharing with us a lecture entitled Membrane Science and Technology for Sustainable Development. Without further ado, I would like to pass to our faculty dean, Professor Dr. Rafiq, to brief a bit about Prof Takashi Masura. Over to you, Prof. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hafiz, uh, for chairing the session. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, welcome to our 71st UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Takashi Matsura from University of Ottawa, Canada. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Uh, Professor Matsura was born in Shizuoka, Japan in 1936. He received his BSc in 1961 and MSc in 1963 from the Department of Applied Chemistry at the Faculty of Engineering, University of Tokyo, Japan. He went to Germany to pursue his doctoral studies at the Institute of Chemical Technology, Technical University of Berlin, Germany, and received a doctor engineer in 1965. After working at the Department of Synthetic Chemistry, University of Tokyo, Japan, as a staff assistant, and at the Department of Chemical Engineering, University of California, United States, as a postdoc research associate, he joined the National Research Council of Canada in 1969. He came to the University of Ottawa, Canada in 1992 as a professor and the chairholder of British Consumers, Gas and as ERC, Industrial Research Chair. He is professor of the Department of Chemical Engineering and became the director of the Industrial Membrane Research Institute, IMRI, until 2002. While heading IMRI, IMRI received financial support from a number of industries and government agencies, namely Air Products, Aquasap Purification Inc., British Gas, Esso Petroleum Canada, Environmental Science and Technology Alliance of Canada, Fielding Chemicals, Petroset, Iron Exchange India, Materials and Manufacturing Ontario, National Research Council of Canada, Natural Resources Canada, Ontario Ministry of Education and Training, URIF Grant, MITEX, and so on. In recent years, he was appointed as the visiting professor in numbers of distinguished University Canada in the University of Singapore in 2003, Laval University in Canada 1999 to 2002, National University of Singapore 2006, Myeongji University Korea 2008, and University Technology Malaysia 2007, 2009 to 2019. Currently, he is Professor Emeritus at the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering, University of Ottawa, Canada. His lifetime achievements were rewarded by many honors. He has obtained the Research Award, International Desalination and Environmental Association in 1983, Fellow of Chemical Institute of Canada, 1989, a session dedicated to S. Suri Rajan and T. Matsura's lifelong contribution to membrane science and technology at the eighth annual meeting of the North American Membrane Society in 1996, G.S. Glinsky Award for Excellence in Research, Faculty of Engineering, University of Ottawa, 1998. A special issue in honor of Prof. Matsura on his 75th birthday 
published by Desalination in 2012, 11th International Conference on Membrane Science and Technology in 2013, Kuala Lumpur, held in honor of Dr. Masura and Professor Pikul Wani Chapichar in 2013, and honorary degree of Doctor of Engineering from UTM in 2017. So that is a brief biography of our speaker today. So here now is Professor Takashi Matsura from University of Ottawa to give a speech entitled Membrane Science and Technology for the Sustainable Development. Professor Takashi Matsura, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Hafiz and Professor uh, Rafiq. Uh, it is indeed uh, my uh, my privilege and honor uh, to make presentation today uh, for uh, the distinguished uh, lecture series. And uh, uh, it is uh, a little bit, uh, it's a pity that I cannot come to Malaysia uh, this year but I'm very happy that I can uh, have contact uh, uh, online uh, by this occasion. Uh, how are you over there? Uh, I'm now uh, talking from uh, a very cold country, uh, Canada, and uh, uh, we had the first snow of this year, a few days ago, and today uh, the temperature is freezing point and we have, uh, we have the mixture of rain and snow uh, today. Uh, and also we are suffering from uh, coronavirus uh, 19 uh, this year, and uh, we are just facing the second wave of uh, coronavirus and uh, or oh, in Ottawa, uh, every day about 100 people are detected positive. Uh, I hope in Malaysia it is uh, uh, much less uh, serious. Uh, anyway, I'm going uh, into my talk uh, by sharing. By sharing the slides. Okay. I hope you can share you can my slides. Yeah, oh, yes, bro. Is it okay? Uh, today, I'm going to talk on uh, membrane science and technology for the sustainable development. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my talk will be focused on water production, production of water, uh, because water is uh, the basis for any sustainable development, as I'm going to uh, indicate later. And uh, wait a moment. Uh, and uh, oh, so oh, now uh, there is urgent need of drinking water supply. Uh, availability of natural fresh water is only 2.5% of Earth's hydrosphere, and the rest is salty water. Uh, like uh, seawater and brackish water, and only 0.26% of Earth's fresh water is accessible to our need, human need. And urbanization and industrialization pollute the available fresh water reserves. So we are facing serious problem of uh, uh, the water. Current water population is 7.8 billion. Uh, only Asia is a home to more than 4.6 billion people. And more than uh, half the world population now lives in urban area. And uh, uh, 
consumes more than 60% of water, energy, and food. And they also account for 80% of the world greenhouse gas commission. So percentage-wise, in 1995, 8% of world's population was affected by water shortages. And it is likely to increase to 42% in 2050. So we are facing very serious problem of water shortage currently. Now, how about the sustainable development? There are three pillars for the sustainable development, energy, food, and water. And water is the basis for all components of this sustainable development. So it is so important. And uh, therefore, my focus is, as I said, on water production. And this is the uh, table of contents. This is uh, uh, the sequence of my talk. First introduction. The second one is uh, the beginning of this is a kind of history of reverse osmosis membrane or desalination. Desalination means it is a, a production of drinking water from salty water like seawater. And uh, I also talk uh, about the development of uh, reverse osmosis membrane uh, by surface modification uh, or by incorporation of nanomaterials. And also I'm going to talk about uh, novel membrane processes for water treatment, like membrane distillation and for those moches and nanotechnology applications, incorporation of nanoparticles and electrospan nanofiber membranes. And also in the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the energy aspect of desalination. By the way, I was told that the audience is a general audience. Therefore, uh, my talk is not, uh, uh, it is, uh, not quite satisfactory for the membrane specialists, uh, but uh, it is uh, for the general audience, but with uh, engineering background. This is, uh, uh, this is what I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk uh, to those people. And how about uh, the, this, there are two, uh, main uh, processes for uh, desalination. Uh, desalination means, as I said, it is production of drinking water from seawater or salty water. Why is membrane process uh, such as reverse osmosis? Mostly it is reverse osmosis. And the, uh, the second one is uh, uh, distillation. It is uh, based on evaporation of water. So the first one is reverse osmosis system. This is membrane system. Here is a membrane. Membrane is a very thin uh, film of uh, mostly made of uh, plastic, uh, polymer, uh, plastic material. And uh, here is uh, uh, seawater. And you apply pressure, then some water goes through the membrane, this thin layer. And on the other side of the membrane, you will obtain drinking water. Uh, there is no salt into this. So this is the membrane process, which is called reverse osmosis. The other process is uh, based on uh, evaporation. It is called desalination. And uh, uh, as you know, the seawater is heated and uh, uh, steam is made at, uh, at the boiling point, and it is then condensed to produce drinking water. And in this process, you have to heat the seawater up to the temperature, boiling point. So you need heat energy. On the other hand, you don't need to supply any heat energy for this process. Therefore, reverse osmosis is basically this membrane process is basically 
energy saving process. So membrane process has uh, advantages of low energy consumption, as I said, it is about one fourth of distillation process. And it is operable at low temperature. You don't need to uh, elevate the temperature to boiling point. So low temperature is okay. And also another important thing is it, it is easily expanded. You can make a large plant quite easily, not uh, like uh, distillation process, just by adding a series of so-called modules. You can do, you can expand uh, the, uh, the, the process. And I already said low energy consumption, so I skip it. This is just a comparison of energy requirement for various distillation processes. These three, these three are based on distillation process. You can see this is the energy requirement, kilowatt hour per cubic meter of water production. And you can see reverse osmosis or energy energy requirement is much lower than uh, the other processes. So uh, this is uh, energy saving process. And another thing I said easily is the process can be easily expanded. This uh, unit is called module and you just add module after module, then you can expand the process up to any uh, size of the uh, any sides of the plant. So it is very important why you can see this is the scale merit, so-called scale merit of the process. Uh, for the plant side, a small plant side, uh, let us see seawater. For a small plant side, the cost, water cost is like this, but when the plant is uh, uh, very large, then water cost goes down to about uh, 0 0.5 uh, dollar, about 0 0.5 dollar uh, per cubic meter of uh, the drinking water. So this scale merit is very important and the scalability or the easily expand, uh, the process can be easily expanded. It is a very important uh, aspect of uh, reverse osmosis process. Now, let us talk about a little bit the history of membrane process. There are a number of important events which occurred in the membrane uh, development, but the very important uh, step was in 1960 of reverse osmosis, discovery of reverse osmosis membrane by Loeb and Suri Rajan. And, uh, uh, it is very interesting, as a matter of fact, that the discovery was done uh, based on uh, this very simple equation. It is called the Gibbs adsorption isotherm of uh, thermodynamics. Uh, whatever this means, this is a very, very simple equation. Uh, probably you learned in thermodynamics. And this equation tells that uh, on the surface of uh, on the surface of uh, seawater or salty water, uh, there is a very thin, uh, a very thin layer is formed uh, on the surface of the seawater uh, or salty water, and the thickness of the pure water layer on top of the uh, salty water is uh, like 0 0.56 nanometer uh, down to 0 0.24 nanometer, depending on the NaCl concentration. This is for sodium chloride uh, solution. Uh, one nanometer means it is uh, uh, 10 to minus nine meter. And uh, uh, this uh, fraction of nanometer, this corresponds to a few water molecules. The size is, uh, uh, few water molecules. Therefore, when you, when you uh, go to the uh, seashore and look at the vast amount of seawater in front of you, 
you can imagine that the seawater is covered by a thin layer of uh, pure water of just a few molecular a uh, few water molecule sites so or this pure water how can you recover this pure water uh, this is engineering and uh, it can be done by a reverse osmosis membrane so this is the principle of uh, reverse osmosis membrane pure water production it is called pre preferential sorption capillary flow model. Or well, there is, uh, uh, according to this model, uh, there is uh, a pure water layer. This is a membrane. This is membrane. Uh, and this is seawater in contact with the membrane. And at the interface between seawater and membrane, there is a pure water layer. And this side, the thickness is, as I said, it is only few water molecules. Or you make a very, very tiny pore, then uh, apply pressure, and this pure water will flow through this small pore. So this is a principle, uh, pre preferential sorption capillary flow model, it is called. And uh, this is therefore a very small, uh, there are two, two requirements. One is the formation of this pure water layer, and uh, another one is the small pore size. These are the two requirements for the successful development of this membrane. Now, uh, but uh, if the membrane thickness is very large, then uh, the, uh, the productivity of the water uh, by the membrane becomes very small. So you have to make this layer very uh, of a layer of a very tiny pore as thin as possible. But if it is too thin, it will be too weak. You cannot apply pressure. So it is supported by a porous sublayer, so-called porous sublayer. Uh, which has uh, many large pores, much larger pores. So this dense skin layer is, has small pores, and this porous sub-layer has very large pores. And mechanically, the membrane is strong enough. Well, this structure is called asymmetric membrane structure. And by this way, flux could increase. So how you can make this kind of structure? Uh, there are two methods. One is so-called uh, phase inversion technique. And this technique is you just make polymer solution. Polymer is dissolved in solvent. Uh, by the way, polymer means, let's say it is so, uh, like plastic material. It is dissolved in solvent. and and cast on top of uh, some uh, supporting material, uh, in this case, glass sheet, and it is cast, this is the polymer solution, it is cast on a sheet, and then it is dipped into water, uh, then uh, this uh, uh, is solidified and uh, uh, spontaneously uh, comes out from this uh, glass plate, and uh, uh, you can get a membrane, uh, just a generation, uh, generation step in cold water, and then you dry. You remove this film and dry. Then you can make a membrane. It, this is a very simple process. And uh, uh, you can, uh, this is how to, uh, how to cast the membrane. The second, uh, Second uh, way of uh, uh, second way of making the membrane is based on so-called interfacial polymerization. Uh, this polymerization method means it is uh, one monomer, monomer A, like methaphenylene diamine, uh, is dissolved in water. This is a water solution, solution in water. And the other one, monomer B, it is like trimethyl chloride, is dissolved in hexane. And they are put together. They are in contact with each other. 
but they are not miscible. They can't, they can't be dissolved in each other. So they are not miscible. Therefore, the, the, here between, uh, between hexane and water, there is a uh, interface. And the reaction takes place between monomer A and monomer B at the interface and uh, A plus B and very, very thin polyamide layer is formed at this interface. And this thin polyamide layer can be used as the membrane. So this is called the interfacial polymerization. And uh, this is a process for a substrate this porous material is put into water, which means the solution of monomer A, and then it is put into hexane, which means solution of uh, monomer B. And at the interface, polymerization takes place and thin polyamide layer is formed. It is called thin film composite membrane because this layer is very, very thin. So I, from now, I often use thin polyamide layer. Uh, this is therefore, it means the thin layer of polyamide with tiny, tiny pores. Now, uh, so this is how to make the membrane. Now I go into the, uh, the, the plant size. Uh, it used to be in 1960 when the membrane was, uh, uh, the, the reverse osmosis membrane was produced or discovered. Uh, the plant size was 100 cubic meter per day only. Now, as time goes on, after how many years? 60 years. Oh, the plant size went up. Now it is a, a so-called megaton plant. In one plant, you produce one megaton of water per day. So the, the plant size has grown so much. And therefore, the productivity was also improved. And plant size has grown. And therefore, nowadays, the water uh, cost is much less than uh, 60 years ago. And uh, oh, okay. so let us look at the surface of the TFC membrane. I already told the TFC membrane. By the way, uh, I said there are two methods of making membrane. One is uh, or uh, one is uh, phase inversion technique and the other one is TFC, uh, interfacial polymerization, uh, polymerization uh, technique. And as a matter of fact, the second technique of, uh, of fabricating TFC membrane is uh, now very popular, much more popular than the first process. So, I look at, we look at the surface of this TFC membrane. It is not smooth at all. This is a SEM picture. It is not smooth at all. Uh, it is very rough. And this each unit is called nodule. Uh, there are a number of nodules on the surface. And when you look at the inside the nodule, this is a TEM image, you can see uh, you can see the void inside the nodule, and it is covered by very thin layer of polyamide. So this is the reason why it has very high productivity, because the surface area, surface area is not, thi not this, but the area is like this. So surface area is uh, uh, much uh, expanded very much by this uh, uh, structure. So this, it is now, or uh, this is the reason why this TFC membrane is, uh, uh, has a superior performance. Or well, you can see that this is a void space filled with water, and this is a thin layer, uh, and uh, uh, sodium chloride is rejected, only water flows through this, uh, uh, this polymer layer. And this is the uh, detailed image of the membrane. <clears throat> oh, 
Uh, however, however, this reverse osmosis membrane is not uh, problem free. Like boric acid, arsenic salts, uh, endocrine uh, disruptor, uh, trace organics, uh, halomethanes, uh, those things cannot be removed from water effectively. And some of them are uh, cancer causing. Therefore, uh, the, the still uh, we have to improve uh, reverse osmosis membrane. And uh, uh, improvement required for membrane technology. Uh, there are uh, uh, two requirements. Uh, one is uh, the first one, membrane productivity has to be increased. Productivity means what? Uh, it is expressed by flux, uh, volume of produced water per unit membrane area per unit time. If this flux increases, then you can reduce the size of the uh, membrane, and therefore productivity is increased uh, quite a lot. So flux increase is very important. And another thing is fouling. It is a decrease in membrane productivity with time due to membrane surface contamination. This should be prevented. So these are the two problems to be solved. And uh, uh, approaches are uh, basically these two approaches. One is membrane surface modification. The other one is incorporation of nanoparticles in thin layer of polyamide. Thin layer of polyamide. I, as, uh, I already explained what it is. And uh, here is the nanotechnology, therefore, coming in. And uh, oh, so I already said, uh, we go down. Uh, so surface modification and incorporation of nanoparticles. Oh, I, I don't talk about this today, but the incorporation of nanoparticles, uh, which is more, uh, many people are now, many scientists are now uh, attempting uh, to improve the membrane by this method. So I just want to talk a little bit. Oh, this is, uh, uh, again, a SEM picture of uh, uh, the membrane. Uh, you, to the top polyamide surface, uh, zeolite was uh, incorporated. And uh, it was done in 2015. And by this way, uh, by this incorporation, the productivity, the flux of the membrane could be increased quite a lot. Another thing, this is a very popular subject nowadays. It is carbon nanotube. Uh, you have heard many times about this material. A carbon nanotube has this structure. This is just one layer of carbon. And uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, this is, has a, cylinder, a cylindrical uh, structure. Uh, there is a hole inside. And uh, uh, when water goes into this hole, uh, then into this space, sorry, uh, I go back into this space. This is uh, this surface is uh, uh, surface is made of carbon material. Uh, therefore, it is very slippery. Water slips on top of this surface, and so when water goes into this uh, uh, this space, then water flows very fast because the surface is slippery. And uh, you, can, uh, you can increase the flux uh, the, quite significantly when you use this carbon nanotubes. Uh, this, is, uh, this work was uh, published in Science uh, in 2006. Uh, it is quite some time ago already. Uh, here, carbon nanotubes are aligned vertically these small pieces, carbon nanotube, vertically, and uh, uh, this tiny membrane was uh, constructed. And this is the size of the membrane, which is uh, the size of the coin. And uh, this membrane was tested, tested for gas permeation as well as water permeation. 
And uh, uh, indeed, the, the productivity or the, water, the flux was order of magnitude higher. Uh, sometimes three order of magnitude higher than the ordinary, ordinary uh, polymeric membrane, uh, plastic membrane. Uh, therefore, it has given hope that we can produce, uh, we can uh, improve, uh, improve the flux or productivity of the membrane tremendously uh, at that time. But industrially, it is very difficult to uh, make the uh, practical membrane. Therefore, it hasn't been commercialized yet. Uh, commercialized yet. Instead, uh, people attempted to incorporate nanoparticles into the polymeric uh, thin layer, polyamide thin layer, and uh, uh, to use it commercially, to use it industrially. And uh, indeed, by this method, the flux has increased, uh, but not as much as uh, uh, it was expected by, uh, by the carbon nanotube uh, membrane. Uh, another thing is, uh, this is also a popular subject, to incorporate this nano, or nanopause in single layer uh, graphene. This is graphene. Graphene is a, a two-dimensional uh, carbon material, uh, and uh, uh, therefore this thickness is very, very uh, small, uh, very low, thickness, uh, very, very thin. And when you make a tiny uh, pore, uh, then uh, this can be used as a membrane, as a membrane, both for uh, gas separation and also for uh, desalination purpose. Uh, and this experiment was also done. Uh, this is a paper is 2015 in nanotech uh, Nature Nanotechnology. But as you can see, this is a uh, the proof of concept was made successfully, but uh, it is, uh, again, the membrane is very tiny uh, size, very small size, and therefore uh, it is uh, not industrially applied. Uh, it hasn't been applied yet. So this is a very interesting material, but still uh, it is uh, not quite uh, applicable uh, in industrially. And uh, uh, another interesting thing is this is uh, uh, acaporin, acaporin membrane. Uh, acaporin is a channel, uh, channel protein forming pores in the membrane of biological cell. So this is biological membrane. So when it is applied for, uh, for uh, water treatment purpose, it is called biomimic membrane, uh, biomimic membrane. And uh, oh, this has uh, the structure and uh, through this pore, through this pore, water goes also very quickly, very quickly, uh, like uh, carbon nanotube. And uh, oh, this was also incorporated into this uh, uh, polymeric uh, thin layer. Uh, this is how to incorporate this uh, acaporin into thin layer of uh, uh, thin selective layer. It is called thin selective layer. Basically, it is polyamide uh, thin layer. And uh, oh, uh, this is another method to incorporate. There are a number of people who have tried to incorporate uh, acaporin into this uh, polyamide layer. And uh, uh, Partially, it was uh, industrialized uh, to some pilot scale, and it is now being used industrially, uh, not necessarily for uh, seawater desalination, but for some other purposes. And uh, uh, again, uh, these developments uh, uh, during the last uh, few years, uh, it, was, it was being made. Now, uh, I have been talking about uh, uh, the increase of productivity, and uh, uh, there are other 
method, but I don't go too much into other method. And uh, oh, so oh, this is uh, the next I'm going to talk about processes other than reverse osmosis. Uh, there are still other membrane uh, processes for uh, seawater desalination. And uh, uh, these two are the typical examples. One is membrane distillation, and the other one is forward osmosis. Membrane distillation. The principle is the vapor transport through dry pores. So here is a membrane. Here is a membrane. And these are the pores. They are all dry, maintained dry. Water doesn't go into water. I mean, liquid water doesn't go into. Uh, because this material is uh, very hydrophobic, which means it does not like water. Therefore, water doesn't go into the pore. It is rejected. Only water vapor can go into the pore. Water can vaporize. And this side, this is feed salty water, which the temperature is high. And this is, I'm sorry, this side is cold water. This side is cold water. The, because the temperature of this side is higher, the vapor pressure is higher than the vapor pressure here. So the vapor moves, vapor is transported from this side to this side. And the salt cannot be evaporated, therefore only water goes through. And here you can get pure water, almost pure water. So this, this uh, uh, process is called, uh, called membrane distillation. This is basically distillation process, uh, but through the membrane. And another important thing is you don't need to heat this up to, uh, up to boiling point. A much lower temperature, like 50 degrees centigrade, is OK. So low heat, low or low quality heat can be used to, to heat up this, uh, this uh, seawater. And this is the membrane distillation process. And it has been also or tested by pilot plant and etc. Uh, many years. Uh, this is a testing unit for uh, uh, for membrane distillation, and uh, the comparison was made between uh, various distillation, reverse osmosis, membrane distillation uh, by many people. Uh, but there is a major problem of membrane distillation. It is poor wetting. Uh, membrane pores are filled with water gradually while you are using the membrane, and flux is decreased. Well, this has to be avoided. And the approach is make the membrane material as hydrophobic as possible. Hydrophobic means it doesn't like water. Or membrane pore size is, should be as small as possible. And uh, oh, many people have been attempting to uh, make it commercial, make this process commercial, and pilot plants were made. But uh, until now, oh, it is uh, uh, large scale, industrial scale membrane distillation was not uh, uh, made. Uh, it is not as popular as reverse osmosis. Oh, yeah, we got to. the problem is, as I said, poor wetting. Now, the next uh, process which I want to talk is uh, forward osmosis. Forward osmosis. This is the process, basically. FO means forward osmosis. Now, this is a membrane, membrane, or oh, like uh, thin film composite membrane can be used. Uh, seawater or wastewater is placed on this side. And the draw solution, draw solution means with very high salt concentration. Like seawater, it's 3.5% of sodium chloride. But this high salt concentration means uh, much more than 10% of sodium chloride. 
so if high salt concentration solution is placed on this side, there is a natural tendency that water, not sodium chloride, but only water goes through this membrane. The membrane is called semi-permeable membrane. Only water passes through the membrane and drawn to this side. Therefore, from seawater, you can get uh, pure water, drinking water to this side. But as you can see, there is a problem. Draw solution contains a high amount of salt. Therefore, this pure water has to be separated from this the salt again. So for doing that, there is a, 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 some energy is required. So this forward osmosis process is also a very popular subject of uh, uh, research, but until now, uh, only a uh, small scale uh, has been uh, developed. And uh, uh, for draw solution, you can use a high concentration of divalent electrolytes like magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, or sodium chloride, potassium chloride, or even carbohydrate, glucose or sucrose can be used. And the interesting uh, thing was ammonium carbonate, which was proposed as a draw solution. Or oh, it is like this, sun in water, seawater goes here, and this draw solution, uh, here is a membrane, draw solution goes on the other side of the membrane and comes here, and draw solution consists of ammonium carbonate. And the temperature is uh, increased a little bit, then ammonia, uh, ammonium and CO2 are separated as gas, and only uh, water is left, and pure water can be produced. So this was also uh, proposed. This process is proposed, very interesting. But still, some heat is required to uh, decompose uh, ammonium carbonate into ammonia and uh, carbon dioxide. And uh, uh, this was also uh, at the pilot plant stage and uh, hasn't been commercialized yet. Now, there is another severe, uh, another problem of so called severe concentration polarization for, uh, for the osmosis. Uh, it means uh, the ideally water flux is uh, uh, increases increases linearly with the draw solution concentration, but in reality it levels off due to the concentration polarization. So you cannot uh, uh, you cannot obtain high flux expected high flux for uh, concentrated draw solution. And uh, uh, to prevent this concentration polarization, a uh, number of research was made to make a special uh, membrane structure. Uh, this is called hollow fiber, and uh, uh, this, uh, some special structure is uh, uh, made in, the, in this hollow fiber membrane. So uh, until now, therefore, these two processes like membrane distillation and uh, for those moshes, uh, they, uh, they are researched by many people, but still industrial application is not as much as uh, in the case of reverse osmosis. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the electrospinning device. Uh, this is one of nanotechnology which is being used uh, very often uh, by membrane researchers nowadays. Uh, polymer solution is uh, uh, loaded into this uh, syringe, and this is syringe pump, and from uh, this is a needle from the top of the needle. Uh, the polymer solution is extruded, and you apply a very high voltage between this needle tip and this collection plate, metal collection plate. And interestingly, 
this the droplet of polymer solution which comes out from the needle is split into nano-sized fibers, nano-sized fibers. And this is the principle of electrospinning. And you can obtain this kind of uh, like sheet, like water, uh, like paper, a sheet. And uh, when you look into BioCM, you can see this nano-sized fiber. Uh, so this is uh, the call, uh, this is uh, uh, electrospan nanofibers because this is nano nano size. Uh, nowadays, this is uh, being used uh, to uh, prevent uh, coronavirus. It is put into the mask and uh, uh, some people are using the mask made of nanofibers. And this can also be used for water treatment. Uh, this, uh, this is a particle treatment from water. You can see you can see the top surface after uh, treating the nanosites, uh, after treating the particles. And uh, this also can be coated, can be coated uh, with polyamide layer, and this can be used for reverse osmosis uh, membrane. Well, this is another nanotechnology application for uh, reverse osmosis membrane or membrane desalination process. And this is TFC membrane performance. And sometimes the uh, nanofiber membrane also contains uh, carbon nanotubes uh, to increase uh, the productivity. So many, many attempts are being made nowadays to, uh, to manufacture novel membranes. And uh, some of them are industrially uh, successful. Now, uh, finally, I'm going to talk a little bit energy aspect of the membrane. This is the uh, cost uh, uh, the breakdown of the membrane. As you can see here, this is power. Power means the energy requirement is about 20% of the total cost. Therefore, you have to reduce the energy requirement as much as possible. And uh, uh, Many researchers again have been trying to reduce the energy uh, consumption. One of the um, important method is this: uh, only 40% of seawater is usually uh, recovered as drinking water in reverse osmosis process, and the rest, 60%, which is pressurized and containing a high amount of seawater uh, salt is thrown away. And because this is pressurized, this is high pressure and flowing, therefore there is energy involved. And this energy has to be recovered. And this is one of the process, sorry. Uh, there are several processes. This is one of the process. Feed goes in, this is seawater, permit goes out, about 60% goes uh, and, uh, of pressurized salty water goes out and this uh, uh, turns the turbine and it is uh, connected to electric generator and by this way energy is recovered. This is a very, very uh, important process or reverse osmosis. And uh, uh, also another imp uh, important uh, uh, method is pressure exchanger. Uh, the, the high pressure brine, again, sorry. Oh, it doesn't go up. It does not go back. Hmm. Something is wrong. Sorry, something is wrong. In the very end, <laughs> I cannot go, what's wrong? Anyway, uh, I wanted to show that. Uh, sorry. Yeah, this is uh, uh, the high pressure brine, uh, 
uh, which is coming out from reverse osmosis module, it is uh, uh, this uh, pressure is transferred to the with seawater. Uh, this process is called pressure exchanger process, and by this way, uh, the energy consumption could be much reduced. And uh, sorry. And uh, oh, nowadays, this pressure retarded osmosis. I don't go in, uh, too much into detail. This process is also uh, being used uh, to reduce the energy consumption in the uh, in novel uh, reverse osmosis plant. And finally, uh, there are several. Yeah, uh, sorry. In the end, it is bad. Oh, this is uh, uh, another approach of uh, production cost uh, reduction in RO water production cost is to use renewable energy like wind or solar energy. And uh, but uh, this is uh, not not yet applicable to a large scale. And uh, uh, those plants are usually in isolated island, uh, constructed in isolated island. And uh, uh, the things in large scale, it was not applied yet, uh, wind or solar. Uh, you can see that the uh, water cost is quite high. Uh, therefore, even though uh, this renewable energy, uh, use of renewable energy is very attractive, uh, it is economically uh, not yet uh, very uh, applicable, uh, except for a very special case, like I, as I said, in isolated island, etc. Uh, so, uh, so this is the end of my talk for today, and thank you very much for your attention. Go out. Oops. Uh, Dr. Hafiz, you need to click unmute. Hello? Okay, sorry. I went out. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Prof, for the very interesting and insightful lecture. I think it's very extremely glad to see the massive progress of the membrane technology development, specifically for the water purification in the last few decades. Okay, uh, now we open the session uh, to the audience. So is there any question from the audience? Okay, we, we have to you. Okay, I, I can, I let me read the question for you, Prof. Uh, how can engineers and scientists overcome the bad perceptions of desalination using membrane? Many claim this technology is expensive, but rather suitable to the area that close to sea and limited access to fresh water. Any opinion, Prof, for this question? Uh, as I understand, you said that uh, the price of water is uh, still high. And uh, yes, yes the, that may be true, particularly the, uh, how can I say, the price of membrane is still oh, uh, quite uh, uh, expensive. Uh, but when you think about, uh, you know, the plant size, as I have shown, plant size used to be very small. Now it is a very large. And uh, also, uh, how can I say, the uh, development of the membrane was uh, quite improved. And therefore, uh, the price of the membrane went down quite a lot. And also, the attempt to reduce the energy cost, energy requirement, that was also that added to the cost reduction. And uh, therefore, as I said, it is about 50 cents, uh, 50 uh, US cents per cubic meter. Uh, I don't know how much it will go down, like 20 cents or 10 cents even. I don't think it will be achieved in the near future. But uh, it has come down to 50 cents. That is uh, okay. enormous. As I 
in uh, membrane distillation, somebody said that if, uh, if energy requirement is zero, it may go down to 30 cents per cubic meter. If you can use waste energy, the uh, water price may go down to 30 cents. But if it could be achieved or not, uh, I, it's a little bit questionable. So, uh, in conclusion, the bigger the plant size, probably the cheaper the the water price can be, yeah, bro. It is attempted, being attempted by megaton. Yes, megaton. Okay, we we have another question, uh, from uh Mr. Adam. So the question is: reverse osmosis process that is known to produce high quality of filtered water. However, the energy consumption of this approach is rather high. Considering the energy saving method, what are the other approaches that can be devoted with which produce a quality, high quality of water as the reverse osmosis? Uh, you mean using reverse osmosis or other or is there any other alternative uh, besides Alternate. reverse osmosis? Yeah. Uh, besides, uh, okay. Uh, as I'm saying again, uh, that uh, mm, uh, membrane distillation, for example, that will, I, I doubt about uh, for the osmosis uh, because the energy requirement for the second uh, step is quite high. Mm. But for membrane distillation, definitely it will go down uh, if, you use, if you use the waste energy, waste, mm. waste heat, like uh, yeah. uh, you that solar heat or atomic, yeah. uh, uh, you know, uh, atomic power plant wastewater. Uh, it has been said for a long time, and uh, uh, it was also tested uh, by some people, uh, but uh, it hasn't been industrialized in large scale. I'm quite sure the price will go down to, to uh, let's say 30 cents or something like that, you know, but uh, uh, in large scale, it hasn't been attempted yet. So that is uh, my answer. It may be achieved in the future. Okay. So pr you, your answer is probably member distillation is the most promising alternative for RO. Is there any uh, commercial MD plan as big as the reverse osmosis uh, nowadays? That use solar solar energy. You mean for combine combination of solar energy and, and membrane uh, distillation? Reverse osmosis or membrane distillation? Um, uh, membrane distillation. Uh, membrane distillation. Yes, it, it was done uh, quite some time ago already, but uh, okay. some uh, the solar energy is still. Uh, quite expensive, isn't it? This is my impression. Therefore, mm -hmm. the, the, the water cost was uh, uh, quite expensive. It was, uh, it depends on the uh, report, <laughs> but uh, it was far above one dollar per cubic meter. Okay. Sometimes it was reported uh, 10 dollar per cubic meter or something like that. So uh, those plants can be, uh, used, as I said, in remote area or isolated island where uh, water is really uh, seriously needed uh, and cost is not an important uh, issue, then you can use it. Yeah, this okay. Is my, Thank okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, we got another question from Muhammad Ayub. Uh, the question is, what type of nanomaterial can be used and what are the most wanted parameters of nanomaterial that can make process more effective and overcome the current drawbacks of reverse osmosis membrane? Yeah, uh, as I'm saying that, uh, you know, new materials like, like uh, oh, carbon nanotube or what is that? It's, uh, those things, graphene. Graphene, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely, I think it is uh, promising, but again, so far, uh, it has not been very successful industrially. 
yeah. the lab give very often uh, good uh, reports uh, have been made. Uh, I think the, the most likely, uh, most likely in the industrial process, the membrane making step is uh, not uh, uh, quite under control. This is what I think, you know, mm -hmm. producibility of the membrane is not easy when you add something. So this is my impression. Like mm -hmm. uh, the membrane, it was uh, proposed a long time ago and it was industrialized uh, by some company, but uh, uh, I don't know if they are continuing to do that or not. So in the future, yeah. mm -hmm. what kind of nanomaterial uh, will be proposed or will be used? It's, uh, I don't know. It is very uh, interesting. So far, people have been using carbon nanotubes, graphene, you know, those things, or uh, what is that? Uh, some other materials but they are quite limited. The same materials are used by many people. So some drastically different materials haven't been proposed yet. Yeah, I agree I'm with you. Yeah. It's, it's, very, it's very hard to see uh, commercial mismatched membrane or nanocomposite membrane in the market. No. Probably no. That, that's one of the reasons, yeah. Yes, until now, uh, it wasn't very successful. Mm -hmm. So we, we got uh, one more question here. Uh, it's a very short one from Taufik. Uh, nano, nanofiber safe, Prof? The question. Nanofiber, yes. Is, is nanofiber safe to be used in water purification? I think the question <laughs> is like that. <laughs> water, water is, I think nanofiber is safe for mask. Now it is, uh, uh, you know, commercialized uh, and uh, many people are using to prevent. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but water, is, uh, it goes into, right? Goes into water and you drink water, right? So yes. uh, my answer is for any nanomaterials, uh, it's not, the effect is not known. So it will be researched in the future. Yeah. Okay. Don't uh, okay. <laughs> so we, I think we have the last question here uh, okay. from Zach Arifin. Uh, you said that nanofilter that used in filtering water is also being used in medical masks to protect against COVID-19. Does it mean the nanofilter is porous and it is compulsory for a face mask to be non-porous material to protect against airborne diseases? Any opinion, Prof? No, I, I can't understand that question very well. Could you briefly summarize that? Uh, could you? Uh, okay. Okay. The, the question, I think. Uh, Okay, okay. Can, can, can we go back to the previous question? I think you we have a other than, Okay. So the question is, I think, is it compulsory for face mask to be non-porous material to protect against airborne disease? I mean, I think the question is like this. We know that the COVID has a specific uh, particle size, which yes. is in micro microfiltration. So yes. the question probably, is it compulsory to have a face mask that have a pore size that's much smaller than the COVID-19 to against any uh, the spreads of this virus? Much smaller. That's what much you're smaller saying. than the, for example, the COVID probably the size is 0.2 micron. So is yeah. the face mask should be less than 0.2 micron or it can be bigger? I think I think it should be so. Actually. Actually, uh, when you remove uh, not uh, the virus, but uh, particles, uh, even when the pore size is larger than the particles, particles can agglomerate in the pore, therefore it can be removed. Mm -hmm. We experience okay. that sort of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. 
the virus may also be, but if, on the safer side, you, you must make uh, uh, the pore size smaller than uh, smaller than the virus. As a matter of fact, the reverse osmosis membrane uh, also has a very, very small pore size, right? It is a sub nanometer. And uh, it should, uh, uh, theoretically, it can remove or it can reject all. Uh, what, what can you say? Um, all uh, uh, all cells, virus. you know. But in all reality, yeah. uh, through you know, large uh, cells, biological cells. I mean, it goes through the uh, pore because there are some some small tiny defects, probably, and mm -hmm. comes to the yeah. side. Uh, therefore, yeah. Uh, I could, on the safer side, you have to make definitely the size of the, uh, what is that, uh, nanofiber membrane. The virus. Uh, uh, smaller than virus. Yeah. yeah. But it cannot be too small, yeah, Prof, because otherwise it's very hard to be to breathe. Yeah, you the, the this mass is too yes. dense. Yes. Yeah. yes, I understand. It has to be porous, but smaller than the virus size. That's yes. The, the key yes. one, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that's it for the q and uh, mm -hmm. I would like to thank you. Thanks to you again, Prof. Masura, uh, for your time and also for your wonderful sharing. And I would like to thank you to the audience for listening. And uh, thank you, everyone. So I hope to see you again in another series of the Distinguished Chair. So uh, I, yeah, I pass back to Prof. Rafik. Over to you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Prof. Hafiz, for chairing the session and for inviting Prof. Matsura to our DLS and to our distinguished speaker, Emeritus Professor Takashi Matsura. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to speak at our distinguished lecture series. Thank you so much for a great sharing session. We receive a lot of comments. Uh, and, and they say that uh, your lecture is very straightforward, very simple for them to understand. So it, it is good for our audience. And we had we received something like more than 200 audience uh, for today's oh. session. Wow. And uh, to all our audience, our global audience uh, worldwide, thank you for watching our Distinguished Lecture Series. Do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Uh, until then, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you very much and bye-bye for now, everybody.